tonight on CBC Vancouver News. They worrying about that come to Canada. Tit for tat travel warnings. Tour operators worried as diplomatic tensions mount between Canada and China. Also, I'm running for election to represent the people of Burnaby North Seymour. Back in the ring, former NDP MP Sven Robinson attempts another political comeback and... I have now tabled a motion of no confidence yeah. in this government. Crushing defeat, British MPs reject Prime Minister Theresa May's Brexit deal. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. We begin with breaking news. There's been a major development in the investigation into the police-involved death of a B.C. businessman. The mother of Miles Gray says the Independent Investigations Office has concluded its probe into the actions of Vancouver police, and the case has now been passed to Crown for possible charges against several officers. Investigative reporter Eric Rankin joins us now live with more. Eric? This has been a case that's dragged on for almost three and a half years and is arguably the biggest dark cloud hanging over the Vancouver Police Force. In August 2015, 33-year-old Miles Gray of Seashell was making a delivery to wholesale florists near Marine Way in Burnaby when he wandered away from his truck and into neighboring Vancouver. A short time later, he had an altercation with a woman who was watering her lawn during water restrictions. Vancouver police were called in. Several officers chased Gray back into a Burnaby backyard where there was a struggle and a violent takedown. Gray was killed. A forensic autopsy showed he had suffered multiple broken bones, a dislocated jaw, and a fractured windpipe. The Independent Investigations Office, which probes police actions, was called in, but for three and a half years, the IIO investigation has dragged on, hampered by the refusal of some of the Vancouver police officers involved to cooperate. Now, Miles Gray's mother, Margie Gray, says she met with IIO Chief Ron McDonald today and has been told the case will finally be referred to Crown prosecutors for possible charges against five of the officers involved. The IIO will only confirm they met with the family today and will have an announcement tomorrow. And Eric, what's the reaction of Gray's family to this news tonight? Well, Margie Gray says she's relieved this part of the process is over, saying it's been hell and she has issued this statement to the CBC. All I know is at the end of the day, my son Miles won't be walking through the door, which devastates us all. All we can hope for is that there will be justice for Miles. Margie is stealing herself for an even longer wait. She says it could be months before Crown prosecutors decide if there's enough evidence from the IIO investigation to lay charges, and even longer, years possibly, before any police officers potentially go to trial. And as always, you can read more about the story at cbc.ca slash bc. Eric Rankin, live in our studio for us tonight. Thanks. Rising diplomatic tensions between Canada and China has prompted tit-for-tat travel warnings. First, the Canadian government updated its advisory. Hours later, the Chinese government told its citizens to take caution. All of that is spooking would-be travelers on both ends. And as our Leanne Young reports, our local tourism industry says it's seeing a downturn, all due to the political battling. Things are quiet today inside Richard Zhang's home office. Even with Lunar New Year around the corner, a typically busy time of year for Asian tourism, his stack of tour itineraries is short. So these are all your Lunar New Year tour yeah. groups? Yeah, yeah. And last year you had? So many. Double of that, you know, double, triple of that group. Zhang says ever since Chinese tech executive Meng Wanzhou was arrested back in December in Vancouver and diplomatic ties between the two countries soured, so did his business. So far, we feel the numbers were going down already. It's uh, really slow now. This latest tit-for-tat travel advisory from both countries is adding to the stress. He's even fielded calls from potential customers asking if it's safe to visit. They worrying about that come to Canada, be, uh, will be uh, arrested in Canada. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like we just say it's no, no way of that. Larger companies tell me they're also feeling the pinch. One company I spoke to says things actually started earlier this month when the U.S. issued a travel advisory for China. 
and they feel the dozens of calls from customers who were concerned. Another company I spoke to that has an office here in Richmond but is based out of China says things have become so tense they were sent a note telling employees not to comment on anything political. It's a stark change from last year which was dubbed the Canada-China Year of Tourism. China is the country's second leading market for tourism and almost half of the tourists that come here end up in BC. Now there's fears. It's worried about like if there's like any trouble there and then it's really hard to get it out. So like it's a little risky. Is that your uh, decision to travel to China? Yes, oh. definitely. I'm actually born in Hong Kong, but I grew up in um, Vancouver. But I, I just feel sometimes I feel unsafe. Any Canadian who goes to China does run the risk of um, being targeted by the Chinese authorities to continue to harass um, Canadians in China to try and exert more pressure on the government of Canada to release Ms. Meng. For Zhang, he's just hoping this whole crisis can be resolved as quickly as possible so business can return to normal. Leanne Young, CBC News, Richmond. The BC Review Board has decided a young man is fit to stand trial in the brutal death of an Abbotsford teenager at her own school. CBC Vancouver News at 11 host Dan Burrett joins us live now with more. Dan, remind us what happened two years ago. Well, Gabriel Klein has been living, being housed at the Forensic Psychiatric Hospital in Port Coquitlam since November 2016. And it was then that he is charged with second degree murder after 13 year old Letitia Reimer was stabbed to death at Abbotsford Secondary School, as we mentioned, November 2016. Now, Gabriel Klein was 21 at the time. He's also charged with aggravated assault after another student was also wounded. She is 14, and we can't name her because of a publication ban. Last April, a BC Supreme Court judge found Klein mentally unfit to stand trial. He lives with schizophrenia and paranoid delusions. But now, after ordering an independent psychiatric assessment, the BC Review Board has found he is fit to stand trial. We just don't know yet when a trial might begin in that case. Anita, Mike. Thanks very much, Dan. The man who held the title of longest serving MP in Burnaby's history is attempting another political comeback. Former NDP MP Sven Robinson has announced he's running in Burnaby North Seymour in the fall federal election. As the CBC's Tanya Fletcher tells us tonight, it comes 15 years after his infamous exit from politics. For coming this morning. A recognizable face has returned to fight for a federal seat in a familiar area. I grew up here in North Burnaby and for over 25 years had the honor of representing Burnaby in Parliament. Sven Robinson was first elected here in 1979. He was Canada's first openly gay member of Parliament and went on to become the longest serving MP in Burnaby's history. But that came to an abrupt end in 2004. That's when he admitted to stealing a valuable ring at an auction. This has been a nightmare. He now calls it a terrible mistake, one he takes full responsibility for. I will regret that for the rest of my life. Even though both the prosecutor and the judge accepted that I was struggling with mental illness at the time. But will voters be willing to forgive and forget? It's one of those things that really made him fall from grace. I think, um, you know, people will uh, may raise it. Some of his opponents might raise it. But I think at the same time, most people are willing to sort of forgive that as somebody who was facing a lot of stress. In the years since the scandal, he's lived and worked overseas doing humanitarian work. Robinson recently moved back home to Burnaby, a Burnaby that he acknowledges has changed. The riding now also includes the Seymour part of North Vancouver, traditionally more challenging for the NDP. But we have won there in the past. We've won there both federally and provincially. He's faced an uphill comeback attempt before. In 2006, Robinson ran as the NDP candidate in Vancouver Centre, but was handily defeated by Liberal Hetty Fry. He says he's running again now for two fundamental reasons. Climate change and inequality. In particular, the crisis in housing affordability. Burnaby North Seymour is a riding currently held by Liberal MP Terry Beach. It's a riding headlined by pipeline politics. Even though he voted against the project, the challenge for the incumbent will be selling Ottawa's Trans Mountain Pipeline to people here who don't want it. It's a very complicated issue and I think people understand that. And even within my riding, there's people that want it built and then there's people that don't want it built. And the reasons that people don't want it built are for a plethora of reasons. Robinson is expected to be acclaimed as the NDP candidate at a nomination meeting later this week. It's a formality that precedes a race proving to be no easy ride back to the riding he grew up in.
Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Burnaby. A group of anesthesiologists says wait times for necessary surgery in BC are climbing fast. More than 85,000 patients were awaiting treatment at the end of our last fiscal year. Roughly 40% of those on the list had been waiting longer than the maximum acceptable wait time. The BC Anesthesiologist Society acknowledges the province is spending millions to combat the delays. Still, they say more work needs to be done. The ministry report goes back to the turn of the millennium. In that period, the population of BC overall has increased roughly 18%. But in that time, the surgical wait list has increased by three times that rate. Orfali says the delays stem from a variety of issues, including human resource shortages, efficiencies, and coordination of care. Fire tore through a metal recycling facility in East Vancouver last night, causing several explosions. 35 firefighters responded to the emergency, but nobody was hurt. There were concerns over other potentially hazardous materials in the building. Investigators were there today looking for a possible cause. People living in Deep Cove are raising concerns about the impact uh, people living in boats there is having on their community. How many people are concerned about pollution in the water? Yes, okay, so everyone. There's no limit on how long a boat can anchor in oh, Deep Cove, and that's got residents worrying about boaters dumping sewage into the water, letting their vessels fall into disrepair or mooring illegally. MP Terry Beach led the meeting, which was attended by residents and boaters alike. Concerned about uh, flushing, I think there's some liveaboards, uh, and uh, there are no pump-out facilities that I'm aware of. It is a swimming area, you know, the beaches have been closed in years past because of the high fetal count. You know, I think it's important that everyone's voices are heard and, and particularly if, um, you know, there's perspectives that are based around, um, you know, misinformation. But I think it's important to, um, you know, counter those, those points and, and, you know, bring the truth to light. It is illegal to dump sewage from boats within three nautical miles of shore under federal law. The closest pump station to Deep Cove is near the Lionsgate Bridge. Well, staying on the North Shore, but moving over to West Vancouver, where councillors have been getting an earful about a plan to use one lane along the Marine Drive corridor for a new B-Line bus. As Mira Baines reports, residents say it will only make congestion worse. West Vancouver council chambers were packed with frustrated people who want to put a halt to a bus lane plan in their community. The first council meeting of the year was their chance. This B-Line proposal with the lane closures is the most delusional idea I've seen surface from this district office. No bus lanes! Last month, some residents protested and even blocked traffic to demonstrate how the loss of one lane would add to congestion along Marine Drive. The B-Line bus route would run between Dundarave and Park Royal. Businesses say that could cause customers to stay away. We don't want to become a drive-through commercial area. We want people to be coming here, staying, visiting. We want to make it easy for them to come and enjoy this part of West Vancouver. And the concern is that the B-Line is focused on getting people in and out. TransLink says the B-Line bus service needs to be fast and frequent, and the dedicated lane will accomplish that. Making sure when we introduce a new service like that, that it doesn't get caught up in general traffic, and that we can come up with a plan that keeps it on schedule and keeps meets those brand promises for customers that then drives more ridership. Some opponents told Council the loss of parking combined with increased traffic congestion are unwelcome changes. They want the B-Line to stop at Park Royal. From uh, the audience here today, the community is sending out a very strong message that this is not for the Ambleside Dunderave corridor. Not everyone is opposed to the idea. As well, it is delusional and honestly, it's just completely wrong to claim that no one uses transit in West Van when an entire fifth of households around here are low income. The district will take public input for up to six weeks. Then council will get a report in the spring. A vote on the plan could come in March. Mira Baines, CBC News, West Vancouver. Well, it's another beautiful, sunshiny day out there today. Mm -hmm. Johanna Wegstaff is here now to tell us all about it. I'm hoping it's sticking around. Well, we've got one more dry day with 
sunny breaks, but the fog's actually beginning to creep back in. For the most part, it hung out on the straight today rather than uh, moving inland like it did yesterday. YVR, it uh, moved out a lot earlier than it did yesterday, although uh, fog was still the story for many inlets across the province. Want to show you the uh, temperatures across the board right now. A little on the chilly side, two at YVR, two's uh, across the valley as well, and uh, four up towards West Van. Uh, dropping down close to the freezing mark again tonight, not quite as chilly. We've been getting a couple degrees below the freezing mark over the past couple of nights with that freezing fog uh, in combination with the clear skies above. That's allowing all of our heat to radiate away. But we've got high clouds rolling in. In fact, here's the latest satellite and radar shot, and you can see this cloud band approaching the border. That's the next weather maker that will slide in for tomorrow. But I think we'll stay mainly dry for the next 24 hours. There is a slight risk of a few sprinkles tomorrow late afternoon, but for the most part, the next system holds off on bringing the rain until Wednesday overnight into Thursday. So getting back up to a seven tomorrow, just a slight risk of some patchy fog before things do mix out in the afternoon. I'm hoping we'll see on and off sunny breaks through the day. Hopefully we can uh, line it up and enjoy one or two of them because yes, the rain is back for the second half of the week and I'll time that out coming up. I'll take every minute I can get. Thanks yes, so much, exactly. Joanna. You're welcome. Well, the capital region's two biggest cities are already looking into merging into one municipality, Victoria and Saanich, meeting last month with the provincial government on creating a citizens' assembly, which could lead to a referendum. But here in Metro Vancouver, the idea of reducing our 21 municipalities is just not on the radar. Our Justin McElroy went to one of the region's smaller towns to explore why. To understand Metro Vancouver politics, you really need a map. In the rest of Canada, the number of municipalities in the biggest city has sometimes gone up or sometimes gone down. But in Vancouver, it's only gone up. 21 municipalities and counting. How did it come to this, though? Let's take a look down memory lane. Our many rivers, inlets, mountains, and farm areas meant that when Europeans settled here, they did so at strategic points all a fair distance away from one another. And this was when transportation was tougher than it was now. So municipalities tended to start as large, mostly rural areas, with a small urban core. But in the 20th century, other urban cores split away from these bigger areas, like West Vancouver, Port Moody, Port Coquitlam, and White Rock. Except now the entire region is built up, so those original rural-urban distinctions no longer really matter. With so many different municipalities in Metro Vancouver, it makes for a lot of weird boundaries, perhaps none weirder than in this very mall, where I've just gone from the city of Langley to the township. So Langley City is debt free, absolutely debt free. And um, since 2005, the casino proceeds have invested $80 million back into Langley City. So we're, we're doing fantastic. <laughs> There's no urban center in Canada broken up into as many municipalities. But provincial law says amalgamation can only happen if a majority votes for it in every city impacted. And small cities like Langley tend to like the current arrangement. We've um, managed to keep taxes down by 19% for, for our residents. Uh, the way I always say it to people is, I've got a credit card, you've got a credit card. Why would I pay your credit card before off before I would pay my own credit card off? And there's no guarantee fewer city halls mean big issues get settled any faster. And I'll go to Toronto as an example. They're one city. Have they been able to build anything? Yeah. Like they've been <laughs> arguing about the Scarborough subway. They have lines that get cancelled every time the government changes. So I don't think by having a larger city you get things done quicker. Yeah. Low taxes, no debt, the ability to make quick political decisions on the fly. 21 municipalities may seem like a lot, but there's lots of reasons why that probably won't change for Metro Vancouver anytime soon. Justin McElroy, CBC News, City of Langley. That, of course, is just one of the many stops Justin has made in his Metro Matters on the Road series. You can watch all of them on our YouTube channel. Just search CBC Vancouver. And while you're there, make sure you subscribe. This newscast is live streaming and available on demand for you to watch on YouTube as well as Facebook. And of course, on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Theresa May's Brexit deal is dead. Now her government is set to face a non-confidence vote. This is all uncharted territory. So what's next? That's coming up.
Hello to all of our viewers watching online. Spring cleaning is just around the corner if you haven't already started like me. <laughs> uh, and there's a new Netflix series that's inspiring viewers to get better at tidying up their home. Yes, but is there an easy way to get organized or are people getting swept up by TV magic? Zach Goody finds out. Like many of us, St. John City Councilor Maggie Burton's home was a bit of a mess. Well, about a year ago, uh, there's four of us living in the house. We had a three-year-old, six-year-old. <clears throat> I was working several jobs. I was running, you know, running for council, and my house was a disaster because I wasn't home that much to clean it up, and so I needed to simplify. Now, this oh-so-common problem is the subject of a Netflix series with star organizer Marie Kondo. Maggie Burton says the show is great for inspiration, but don't confuse TV and social media with real life. I really like the idea of letting go of objects, if you're able to, uh, but for us it was more about creating systems that allowed us to have a basically functional space to live in because you know we actually live here <laughs> i feel like the idea of tidying up is often to create like an instagram perfect space that looks like nobody lives in the house like you're staging an airbnb for rental professional organizer april miller isn't surprised the show is such a hit she's seen a lot of closets and she knows that clutter is a widespread problem I think there's a few things that go on. Number one, we now live in a time when both parents work. So that wasn't always the case. One person did actually, you know, they were the homemaker. Well, now nobody's really making home. Um, and then we also have way more stuff than we used to. Miller is a fan of Kondo's method. To get started, she says, take aim at what's easiest to let go of. Starting with the area, not the family photos that are, you know, generations back, but something that's super unsentimental, which she actually recommends as well. She says, you know, don't do sentimental until the very last step. But when you're taking those steps, don't just think about what to get rid of. Think about where it's going to go. I would like for people to keep in mind to try to keep objects out of the landfill and bring them to a thrift store or a call for someone to come pick them up. You can go on the curb at St. John's website and um, you can input an item and it'll tell you what you can do with it. So I encourage people to check that out for sure. And when you drop that bag at the donation box, just say Arigato. and walk away. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. This is all the talk. In the lunchroom, everybody is cleaning out their place. It's all over Instagram. Can't stand the clutter. Don't like the clutter. Me neither. No. I, she, you know, she talked about having this perfect Airbnb house. I think we should all know. <laughs> I should be careful what I say, but I'm not a fan of clutter, so. Yeah. You know what helps? What? Moving. If you move, so you, you got, end up getting you rid of- You got rid of everything yeah, in your totally. move. Yeah, totally. You just, uh, you end up getting rid of a ton of stuff, especially if you're downsizing, so. Good advice. Go. <laughs> All right. If you're watching with us on Facebook right now, we'll be back in just a few moments. British Prime Minister Theresa May was handed a di disappointing defeat today. British MPs voted overwhelmingly against her Brexit plan, and the opposition is now calling for a non-confidence vote. The government has lost the confidence of this House and this country. I therefore, Mr Speaker, inform you I have now tabled a motion of no confidence in this government. With 202 MPs for and 432 against, today's Brexit vote is considered the most convincing defeats of any British government since the 1920s. It was just 10 weeks left for Britain to leave the European Union bloc. The process remains mired in chaos and uncertainty. The CBC's Thomas Degla has more from London. Free papers, free standards. The build-up to this vote has been huge. Free papers. The stakes enormous for the future of everyone in this country. No, no, no. Still, with that weight on their shoulders, most MPs seemed to make an easy choice. That is a monumental leap into the unknown that I will not make. Labour will vote against this deal tonight. Yeah. Even Conservatives had no trouble blasting their leader's plan. It is our duty to vote against it. Especially the so-called Northern Ireland backstop, which could keep the UK tied to European trade rules for years. We 
cannot now treat the public as idiots. The decision of the joint At the heart of the problem. vote is so this 585-page right. EU divorce agreement, supported by Conservative MP George Freeman. This is a sort of political civil war, and I, I'm voting tonight because whatever else I think, this has got to end. Tonight, Theresa May received a warm welcome, perhaps out of pity, ahead of a big defeat. This is an historic decision that will set the future of our country for generations. MPs left the chamber to supposedly vote in private, yet some posted pictures to show the staggering size of the crowd voting no. The eyes to the right, 202. Ooh. The nose to the left, 432. Wow. Yes, it's a brutal beating for May, but she had a speech ready just for this. To listen to the British people who want this issue settled. May says she'll meet with MPs from all sides to find a way forward, but not so fast. I have now tabled a motion of no confidence in this government. That vote will come tomorrow. This House is still a mess. That's the CBC's Thomas Degla in London for us tonight. Meanwhile, the relationship between Canada and China continues to worsen. As Canadian officials try to get clemency for a convicted drug trafficker facing execution, two more Canadians are also behind bars. They're apparently detained in retaliation for the arrest of China's Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou. Evan Dyer walks us through this deepening diplomatic crisis with Canadians caught in the middle. Canada has asked for clemency for Robert Schellenberg. We have already spoken with China's ambassador to Canada uh, and requested clemency. A tough ask as the relationship only seems to get worse, evidenced today by China accusing the Prime Minister of malicious slander. And after Canada changed its travel advisory, China has responded in kind, warning of the arbitrary detention of a Chinese citizen. Meanwhile, Schellenberg's family can only watch Foreign Affairs Minister Christopher uh, Freeland spoke to his father today. It was a very emotional conversation for him. He and his family have asked the government to do all it can to save their son from death row. But that may be an uphill battle. We learned today that two Chinese-Canadian dual citizens have been executed for drug crimes in China in recent years, suggesting that even in normal times, it's hard to stop a Chinese execution. Prime Minister Harper wrote a personal letter to Xi Jinping asking for clemency and they proceeded anyway the next day uh, with the execution. Canada's then ambassador says the only way forward is to get other allies on side. I think, I would hope that the government will continue with this strategy because we have to attract as much international attention to this. China is concerned about its reputation and it may uh, make them think twice. A message seemingly echoed by the foreign affairs minister today. We now have Germany, France, the Netherlands, the EU, the United States, the UK, Australia, Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia publicly coming out and speaking against these arbitrary detentions. None of which has been lost on China. I have noted that some Canadian officials have been going all out to encourage more of their allies to side with them, said Hua, but these several countries cannot represent the international community. I think we need to persuade China that it is not in their long-term interest to detain foreigners, right, for whatever reason. So far, the Canadian government has stopped short of the Prime Minister directly reaching out to China's president about Schellenberg or the other two detained Canadians. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Dozens of Indigenous leaders are meeting in Calgary to talk about buying the controversial Trans Mountain Pipeline. The project's been in limbo after Ottawa ruled last August there needs to be more consultation. Now, as the CBC's Kyle Bax reports, an organization representing more than 100 First Nations is kicking the tires on the pipeline. The Indian Resource Council of Canada is spearheading the effort to buy the Trans Mountain Pipeline. The group represents 134 First Nations and says the majority of them want an ownership stake. The federal government bought the pipeline last summer for $4.5 billion. Construction of the Trans Mountain expansion is on hold after a federal court ordered more consultation with First Nations and further assessment of the possible impacts on the marine environment. 
The Indian Resource Council says it wants the pipeline to be 100% owned, operated and monitored by First Nations. Our job right now is to kind of get the chiefs together and, and the leaderships together to help make a consensus to, to ensure that we're all on the same page. We're all, we're all looking for something to get out of poverty. You know. Some First Nations in BC staunchly oppose the Trans Mountain project, regardless of whether Indigenous groups become the owner. The Squamish Nation says the pipeline would still cross their land and concerns about the impact on the environment remain. The Indian Resource Council says it wants to present a proposal to the federal government in the next few months to buy the project. This week, they'll decide how they would pay for it. Kyle Bax, CBC News, Calgary. Home sales in BC dropped 25% last year. What the Real Estate Association is blaming it on, coming up. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. They worrying about that come to Canada. Canada has updated its travel advisory for China, but China is also warning its citizens against coming here. And as local tour operators concerned, they say they've already had fewer inquiries because of the ongoing political tension between the two countries. Even though it has been 15 years since I last served in Parliament, Many people welcomed me back, 
with memories of my service to them and to the community. Attempting another political comeback ahead of next year's federal election, former NDP MP Sven Robinson is expected to be acclaimed as the party's candidate in the riding of Burnaby North Seymour. And after 41 months, the investigation into how a B.C. businessman died during an encounter with multiple Vancouver police officers has finally concluded, according to the man's family. Miles Gray was unarmed when police arrived to investigate reports. A man was spraying a woman with a garden hose. More details are expected tomorrow when investigators will hand over the file to Crown Counsel for consideration of charges. And the latest real estate numbers show home sales province-wide dropped 25% in 2018. And the BC Real Estate Association says it's because of the mortgage stress test introduced at the beginning of last year. That test requires prospective buyers to qualify for an interest rate higher than what they're actually getting to ensure they can afford their mortgage if rates go up. So how did that affect home sales? Well, last year, just under 80,000 residential properties were sold down from more than 100,000 properties the year before. And the drop was even more pronounced in Greater Vancouver. In 2017, more than 35,000 homes were sold. But last year, home buyers purchased just over 25,000 properties. Mike spoke to mortgage broker Dan Poulter earlier today about what's changed. So the Real Estate Association is blaming the, the mortgage stress test for this big drop in, in sales. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, you know what? Uh, economists have actually been predicting that, and we've been predicting that the stress test would actually have a material impact. And what we're seeing today is really a reduction in purchasing power as a result of it. And the activity has been coming off for some time now. And the results we saw today were just simply a, a summation of everything that we saw happen over the past year. So are, are would-be buyers in this province just kind of, kind of giving up? Uh, feeling frustrated. They're sitting on the front lines thinking, you know, uh, can I qualify for a mortgage? Uh, what I thought I could qualify for is not necessarily the case. Uh, individuals that are renting, for example, for say $1,500 or $2,000 are actually finding that they can't even be qualified for the same amount of a mortgage payment that they were paying in rent. So they're staying as renters for uh, longer than we would anticipate. We're also finding individuals uh, that they're stuck with the institution that they were. So there's less choice available to consumers today than was uh, six months, 12 months, and 18 months ago. Is it also a matter of, of, of some would-be buyers maybe lowering their expectations? Absolutely. I mean, if, the, if this current regulation is going to stay in place for some time, you're simply going to have to. Uh, it's best to talk to a mortgage professional and find out what you qualify for before you go out shopping, as opposed to going and finding your dream home and then being disappointed in the, uh, the facts of the matter. Getting that big surprise. So. Uh, it's definitely a big surprise. Any other advice that you'd pass along to people who are, are trying to get into the market? Uh, well, first thing, if you're already in the market and have a mortgage, make sure that you make your mortgage payments on time because uh, the uh, renewals at the end are based on whether or not you make mortgage payments. And if you don't make mortgage payments, uh, you may find yourself in a predicament not being able to continue on with that institution you're with if they choose that you're not a fair uh, risk assessment. If you make your payments, they're likely just going to let you continue on. Individuals that aren't in the market, definitely get uh, talk to a mortgage broker, get professional advice find out what you qualify for and especially for those that are self-employed they're finding it extremely challenging today and I think that uh, professional advice will let them uh, talk to their accountant and make sure they're doing the right things for the future thanks very much no problem thanks for having me at 637 on this Tuesday evening here's a look of BC place the fog is still lingering in some areas but it's about to be replaced by rain Johanna's forecast is next
Well, we had more clear skies overnight and today, but if you wanted to soak up some sun, well, you could forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> I what? had to, I had to, I'm sorry. <laughs> there were still some great opportunities for photos though. These overnight shots mm. were taken by our late night cameraman, GP Mendoza. Wow, and just as he did on his way into work yesterday, late night host Dan Burrett recorded this video going over the viaduct on his way home. Foggy, foggy. Oh. Yeah, some nice shots there. Mm -hmm. Look at Dan recording in the morning, then at night. I know. What is he? Yeah. He never rests. I hope he's got a he little handset that he or He does. I questioned him already, and he said it was <laughs> okay. all hands free. Safety so. first. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, we are looking at the risk of fog again tonight. I'm starting to, to see it creep in across the strait, but we get one more dry day out of the mix. A, a beautiful start out there. You, you can see the uh, low, shallow fog creeping in once again, again to the city this morning. But also note the higher cloud, uh, the cirrus, uh, streaming in the opposite direction, coming in from the south. That actually helped to mix out our upper levels of the atmosphere, meaning the fog wasn't quite as widespread inland. And just some stunning photographs uh, being taken across the city today. Uh, this one, nice and early, you can see uh, the fog uh, lingering in through our valleys. Signs of spring along the seawall uh, sea today. Those are all daffodils. And then a uh, nice day for a flight up Indian Arm. Beautiful uh, blue skies with snow-capped mountains. It was a stunner of a day, although I should note, for those of you who were socked in, we did see some lingering fog uh, in northern inlets. And same story for the interior. Still seeing that low cloud locked in again today. The next system is quickly approaching from the south, and that's going to squeeze out our high-pressure system that's keeping that fog locked in. So Taking you through the overnight increasing cloud uh, will be our story, but it's not an all overcast uh, Wednesday out there. In fact, I think we were looking at a mainly mix of sun and cloud. Risk of seeing that patchy fog to start, uh, but I think definitely the mix of sun and cloud will be our bigger story through the afternoon. And I think we will get some blue sky breaks out of it, but again, not just the, uh, not the bluebird skies we've been enjoying for those of us not in the fog the past couple of days. So here's that system sliding up, pushing that high pressure ridge out of the way. The center of the low remains offshore though over the next 24 hours. So we just got the high cloud at the edge of this system. Slight risk as I mentioned earlier of a few stray showers tomorrow afternoon. The bulk of it though will move in for Wednesday overnight into Thursday. So Thursday and Friday looking a little soggy as we tap in to that southerly flow. Uh, let me show you that full range uh, forecast. We do have a couple of days of showers in the mix there. Uh, temperatures about seasonal, if not just above. I think that Saturday will be the wettest of those uh, three days, but clearing out at this point for Sunday into Monday. Not a bad forecast. Let's take a look at uh, one last gorgeous shot of downtown oh, wow. great. I know our control room uh, we've got some uh, talented photographers in we there do. And that's a gorgeous shot that that's th these are the days where it makes all those rain days worthwhile very nice well some passionate plane chasers had quite a thrill over in Victoria today mm. that's right a heavy-duty Russian transport aircraft made a soft landing at the city's airport the Aleutian 76 arrived to piggyback an island-based helicopter all the way to Chile, where it will help fight the country's wildfires there right now. The helicopter would normally make the long journey through the states to Santiago alone, but the American government shutdown provided a roadblock, resulting in a show for these uh, self-declared ramp rats. And I mean, I looked at pictures online and it looks huge, so I think it'll be exciting. Something like this that is huge, Coming in and landing here, this is special, uh, magic. The helicopter will be dismantled before it's loaded into the four engine strategic airlifter. She captured the world's attention. A Saudi teen who is now in Canada speaks with the CBC, the risks she took and what she's looking forward to with her new freedom. That's next.
A Saudi teenager who has captured the world's attention is, of course, now here in Canada. Almost overnight, Rahaf Mohammed has become a symbol for women escaping oppression. She spoke with CBC senior correspondent Susan Ormiston about the risks she took and her hopes for the future. Hey. Hello, welcome. Welcome. Hello, I'm Susan. For the first time, Rahaf Mohammed explains why she fled her country, her family, and the repression she says she endured in Saudi Arabia. Uh, from your mother and your brother, violence, were they beating you? Once she turned 18, she plotted an escape. Did you start that letter? كتبتها وأرسلتها لصديقاتي في حال إن اختفيت ينشرونها للعالم يعرفون أنا إرسالي. But the UNHCR intervened and asked she be granted asylum somewhere. Canada agreed. <laughs> Tell Canadians I love them, she told us. But even here, she still faces about a hundred threats daily. طبعاً حاسف أمان إني في بلد آمن زي كندا. لكن ما أقدر أقول إن وضعي جدا جدا في أمان خصوصا إن الكل يعرفني وعندي يعني ناس كثير يكرهوني سواء من أهلي أو من ناس في السعودية. Her family put out a statement disowning her, the naughty daughter with shameful behavior who embarrassed our Islamic customs and values, and begged the kingdom not to blame the family. Do you believe that this letter, this declaration, is from your family? Clearly, it cuts deeply. Blocked entirely now from her five sisters. Did you expect that? هل أنتي كنتي فكرة عارفة إن الموضوع ده هيحصل إنهم هيعملوا كذا؟ لا. No, she didn't expect it. Rahaf Mohammed is now both reviled and admired. Women are asking for help. She advises them not to escape. It's too risky. How do you respond to the critics who say you got special treatment? أنا حياتي كانت بخطر لكن ممكن أني كنت محظوظة أني لقيت إجابة سريعة. And for now, no regrets. Thank you. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Toronto. There are new reports of gunfire tonight, even after Kenya's interior minister said the deadly attack on a luxury hotel in Nairobi was under control. Authorities say extremists targeted the hotel and office complex with explosions and gunfire. Witnesses report seeing at least five bodies with fear that more people may have been injured. More and more uh, people have been rescued. We are seeing uh, the hostages just uh, making their way out of the uh, uh, building and of course lucky to be alive. That's Kenyan TV showing the dramatic siege as it unfolded. Panicked hotel guests and shoppers and staff can be seen fleeing amid gunfire inside with cars burning outside. The siege lasted more than five hours before security forces moved in to take control of the area. The Somalia-based militant group Al-Shabaab is claiming responsibility. It has carried out many attacks across the country in the past. Most notably, the attack on a mall in 2013 that killed almost 70 people. A new ad for Gillette is provoking backlash at a time when the Me Too movement is changing the conversation around masculinity. The spot challenges men to change their behavior and set a better example. But as the CBC's Eli Glasner tells us, some men are so angry about it, they're boycotting Gillette products. Is this the best a man can get? 
The new ad cuts to the idea of what it means to be a man, boys be boys. repositioning Gillette's tagline to take a stand against toxic masculinity. No going back. Online, the ad quickly racked up millions right of views and a backlash. Act. Actor James Woods tweeted about the razor company jumping on the quote, men are horrible campaign. In London, Piers Morgan added his voice. Men are fed up with this. They are fed up with being told how awful we are all day. Mm. We're fed up with it, sorry. Soon customers who don't like mixing politics with smooth chins started chucking their razors. Nowadays, being in the middle, it gets you no attention. Attention is the oxygen of marketing. If you want to be out there, you have to pick a side. Former ad executive Tony Chapman says Gillette would have expected that kind of reaction. He thinks the ad is a brilliant way to confront the brand's history. You know, cleat shaven faces, your, your pathway to having sex and getting kissed by a beautiful woman. They felt they had permission to play there. And in doing so, they're taking a very hard pivot for the brand. And with that comes both risk and reward. It's pretty smartly done, eh? Like Author Rachel Giza is skeptical when companies appear to be socially conscious. But she says the fact that it makes business sense is significant. The fact that this ad exists suggests that this critique um, and rethink about masculinity um, has become so much a part of the cultural conversation that a company thinks that an ad like this will resonate with men. Gillette is just the latest in a string of brands to challenge customers. When Nike embraced NFL player Colin Kaepernick, customers set their shoes on fire, but... We followed their share price, their sales, uh, the, the affinity for the brand. All of these things have been very positive since they made that move. And while the new Just ad is rubbing me. some men the wrong way, Chapman uh, says Gillette is actually right targeting brand. women who make the majority of household some purchases. You like Laster, CBC News, Toronto. It's a tiny place in the state of Minnesota that's only accessible from Canada. Coming up, the petition to make the Northwest Angle part of our country. Well, it's a geographic oddity, a sliver of the United States cradled between two provinces. And just as peculiar, you can only get to the tiny Minnesota hamlet from Canada. Mm. There's no road to the U.S. And as the CBC's Ian Fraze explains, that may be why an anonymous petition is suggesting the Northwest Angle become part of Canada. It's an odd existence to live at the Northwest Angle. 
an isolated sliver of Minnesota that looks, from a map, like it doesn't belong in the United States. Paul Colson knows this better than most. We are so far away from the rest of the United States that you don't have any, any of the things that people just normally take for granted. Can you imagine having to tell people that to have a passport to come over for supper for your house? That's the reality of life here, day or night. In this border town in the United States, affectionately known as the Angle, nobody is talking about building a 30-foot wall. There's not even a border agent. Rather, all we have here is a shack with an iPad and a phone. Visitors use the iPad to submit their personal details and await approval to enter the United States. Surrounded on three sides by Canada, the Northwest Angle is a geographic oddity that owes its being to a mistake. It came about in the 1700s when the people who defined the boundary between Canada and the United States misidentified the source of the Mississippi River and the shape of Lake of the Woods. Hence, the angle became secluded from the rest of the USA, accessible by road only from Manitoba. The community's been in the news recently because an anonymous petition suggested the region should be handed to Canada, but residents here think that's just a joke. Over at the fishing lodge, the Colsons acknowledge life at the angle isn't for everybody. We might be a little Great. bit crazy because this is the end of the road and it seems like the end of the road attracts it's a focal point for crazy people. Crazy people. <laughs> and I would describe some of the people up here as kind of crazy. Yeah. So we probably do fall into that category. We just don't think we're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Ian Fraze, CBC News, Northwest Angle. So interesting. Isn't yeah. Kind of look kind of like Point Roberts, not exactly, but the the geographic Yes, audience. I find those border interesting border stories yeah. uh, so cool. Mhm. Mm you can always find our news program online at cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news is right here at 11 o'clock after the National with Dan Burrett. Have a good night. Good night.